Well, come and, and good morning again, and I can see more people through, so praise God that you're here this morning, and I ask that God will bless you as we continue to study from the book of Jude. And we, we did part one that sort of gave us a bit of a background to what Jude was and, um, and what his main teaching was about. But today we're doing Jude... We're carrying on with just the 25 verses, but we're going to do another section of Jude. So I pray that you've got your swords with you, um, and, and we're going to uh, go through his word in a minute, God's word in a minute. So last time when I spoke, I said that Jude is also called the letter that Jude did not intend to write. He wanted to write something different, and God changed it at the very last minute. But Jude is a book that speaks about apostasy. And we said that the whole book can be summed up in one word. Who remembers that word? Anyone? Beware. Beware. Very good, Vincent. I'll give you 10 points for that this morning. The whole book is about caution. Beware. There is something in the church today that we need to take stock of. And, he, and Jude wants us to know that Satan is alive and he's doing stuff across the world today. And we need to be alert to what he's doing. And yet it is a book I said that was neglected. It was a book that's hated by many because Jude calls out the sins of the world today. He calls it out. And the sins, unfortunately, are also in the church it was in the New Testament church, and it is still in our churches today. No different. And Jude writes this because he wants to call us to be warriors. He wants to call us to take up our arms and be ready at all times. And the language in Jude, I said, was strong. It was harsh. He said it like it was. There was no mincing of words. I think it was Vijay, someone who prayed that there's no softness, that it's, it's, it's absolute what God says, and God says that, and exactly that. Nothing taken away, nothing added. And Jude is calling us now for spiritual warfare. He says, you are not fighting against flesh and blood, yep? But what are you fighting against? The powers of? Yes, principalities, powers of darkness. That's what you're fighting against. And, and, and he's saying, come on, Christians, get up. It's time to fight. It's time to fight. And do you know I said last, last time when I was up here that the church is the only church that can fight in the spiritual realm. Do you, remember, do you recall that? Church, are you listening to this? You are the only body that can fight in the spiritual realm. What, a, what power you have rested in you because of what Jesus did on the cross. You have the authority to fight in the spiritual realm because you are the church of God. Amen? You're not a weak church. And we looked at how Jude prepares us. He says there's going to come people with dishonoring attitudes. There's going to come people with deception, deceiving the souls. And, and today I'm going to talk to you about people who are going to creep into the fellowship. They're going to creep in in different ways. And they're creeping in. They can creep in through music. They can creep in through the word. They can creep in through the type of word that they bring. It can be very psychological. People go up feeling high for about an hour or so and then hit rock bottom straight after because there's no meat in that word. There's a creeping in that's happening and Jude is preparing us today to say, you've got to be alert to that creeping because when that creeping starts, you need to know, you need to know the word of God. And the only way you're going to know the word of God is when you read the word of God and you impart it into your life. Amen? I, we've made a rule now in youth that you will not bring your mobile phones to church or to youth group. You're going to bring the word of God with you. Simple reason. You can look at all the history and the data. Every time something changes by way of technology, you don't know what's changed. But you take a Bible built, uh, you know, that was endorsed in 1801. Four revisions earlier, the words are still the same. But you don't know in terms of technology, this, in, this, uh, in the NIV, for example, there's over 300-something words that have been deleted, 3,000 words that have been deleted. And there's also the One World Bible that's just been signed up, where it's not going to be Jesus, it's just going to be God. 
And you can be reading that one world Bible and you could be saying, is it Allah? Is it, you know, Buddha? Is it another God? This is all happening right now, church, and we need to be really ready because you, and you can only be ready when you know the word of God. So I want to encourage you today to carry the sword with you. Carry the word of God with you and be ready. Go buy a smaller one if the big one's too heavy. Put one in your car. Put one in your house. Keep one under the drawer in your workplace, wherever. Take one with you. Let's read Jude, Jude 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And I said that before. He's saying you've got to fight for your faith. How many of you are willing to stand up for Jesus? How many of you, when you hear people swear and take the name of Jesus in vain, how many of you are bold enough to say, that is an offense, you know, that you're, you're, you're speaking against the God I worship. For there are certain men, and this is where I'm going to start my message because we've done that first part. For there are certain men crept in unawares. You don't know it, but they are in the church who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore, says Jude, I put you in remembrance. I'm going to make you remember, he says, that though ye once knew this, how the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed them that believed not, and the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. In other words, every person, every person who is sold out to Satan has already received a condemnation. Isn't it powerful? It says, from days of old, judgment has been reserved for them who will work against God. Verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. What a warning to the church today. Likewise also, look at these strong words, these filthy dreamers. Because they come in with their, they come in with their little claws, but you, they, they look so great on the outside. These filthy dreamers, they defile the flesh, despise dominion. That means they don't, they don't subject themselves to authority within the church body. And they speak of evil dignities, or speak evil of dignities. That means of angels and the supernatural. Yet, he says, Jude, Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses and does not bring against him. He did not even bring a word against Satan except in his, in his accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Even Michael, the archangel, told Satan, the Lord will rebuke you. Verse 10, but these speak evil of those things which they know not. So the people coming in, they will speak evil of things that they do not understand but what they know naturally as brute beasts in those things they corrupt themselves woe unto them for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah these are spots now this is the character of the people that are coming through these are spots in your feasts of charity they say they love you, they sit, they want in a place of honor. And they feast with you, they actually sit with you and they enjoy your fellowship. Feeding themselves without fear, they're partaking of everything that you have to offer. They are clouds, they are without water, they are as clouds without water, they're carried about of winds. Trees whose fruit withereth, that means they don't bear any fruit. And the fruit twice dead, they're twice dead, they're plucked up by the roots. Verse 13. 
raging, raging waves of the sea, forming out of their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. That means shooting stars. They're like shooting stars. They're bright one moment, and when they fall to the earth, they just disappear because they've burnt out. That's how they are. They come with their doctrine. They come with their music. They come with their philosophy. They come with their psychology. They come with their errant methods of dealing with God's word, but they are like a shooting star of no effect. And then it says in verse 14, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these things, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints. Amen? The Lord is coming. Say, turn to someone and say, The Lord is coming. But he's coming, church, and this is the warning in Jude. He's coming to execute judgment upon. I didn't hear that. He's coming to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. These are murmurers, complainers, Walking after their own lusts and their mouth speaketh great swelling words. They speak wonderful. How beautiful you look. So wonderful. You know, they butter won't melt in their mouth. These are the kinds of people. They're having men's persons in admiration because of an advantage. They want the favor and, and the favor and the blessings of men because they've got an ulterior advantage. What a powerful book. And I'm going to stop there. You see, church, for, for, for the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking, and when I come up to preach again, we'll, we'll carry on doing Jude. We know that in the beginning, Jude wanted to write a letter about salvation. Perhaps, you know, he thought about it, he looked around, and he said, wow, the church of Jesus is growing so well, and let me encourage everybody. And he perhaps sat down with a pen and a paper and went, let me write a letter, he says, for the common salvation, encouraging every one of us on a common salvation. You know what common salvation is? Like us sitting here today. Are you all saved? I don't get that. Are you all saved? Yes. Amen. Are you saved because of Jesus? Yes? That's your common salvation. It doesn't matter which country you come from, where, what language you speak. We all sit here, and if, even if there's one person missing, you say, I wonder what happened to them. They were not at church today. Yep? Common salvation. Something binds us all together. And Jude was going to write about common salvation. He was going to put his pen to paper and say, so wonderful to see my brothers and sisters from all over the world coming and worshiping Jesus. But the Holy Spirit came in and the Holy Spirit said, I don't want you to write that because it is necessity that you write about what is happening in the churches today. You see, when God changes something, you cannot stop what God's about to do. And his Holy Spirit will come. Amen? And we need to be ready. That's that word, but. It says in God's word, the Holy Spirit impressed upon Jude that it is necessary, Jude. Don't worry about that salvation bit. They're, they're, they've got that part. But there is something creeping into the church today that you need to be writing about. Because when I come back, I'm going to come back with judgment. Praise God. When I look at Jude, I also look at Matthew 23. Matthew 23, 13, there are scriptures there. God's word, church, is not just Jude that was warning us. Jesus himself warned us so many times of what is to come. We need to be ready. You know, I, I don't know about you, but I, can I encourage you to get out your Bibles? This is like there's no time like now. Get out your Bibles and start reading God's Word. The, you know, the, God's Word is a preparation for His coming, His soon coming. Matthew 23, 13, He says, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, and neither you suffer ye them that are entering to go in. In other words, these people, they bring in, they bring in a message where they stop others from entering the kingdom of God because of their message, their feel-good message, their, their diluted message. But they themselves can't enter into the kingdom of God because they don't want to. They're a stumbling block. Verse 14. Another, another passage. 
Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And look at what they do. You devour widows' houses, and for a pretense you make long prayers. Therefore you shall receive greater damnation. In other words, you can stand up and you can preach and, 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 and pray and pray and pray and pray. Use great big words. And God says, I'm going to judge you. I'm coming to judge you. For every word that you have said, I'm coming to judge you. There's a damnation that is there. Let your prayers, therefore, be what God wants it to be. Amen? Verse 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. What again? He says, hypocrites. For you compass the sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, you make him twofold more of the child of hell than yourselves. In other words, you go out, you say, I'm going to go out and preach. I get a soul. But what I do, I give him the false doctrine and he ends up in hell and you end up in hell. Verse 27 of the same chapter 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. And this is, this is brilliant. Jesus does not mince words, yet you are whited sepulchers. Have you been to a cemetery? Yep, and you'll see beautiful, beautiful carvings, angels, polished stones, white and, and polished black, you know, granite and marble and everything. Your whited sepulchers appear beautiful on the outside, but within, in the depths of who you really are, this is what the scripture is saying, you're full of dead man's bones and uncleanness. Not dissimilar to what Jude is telling us today. Woe unto you. Woe unto you. Woe unto you. Because there is coming a day when the Lord will return. And the church needs to be ready. The church needs to be ready for his coming. Why does Jesus speak in such scathing terms? You see, because because Jesus is preparing us for something that has crept into the church today. And therefore in Jude verse 4, if you put up Jude verse 4 please, it says, let's read together. For there are certain men who crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Church, this was what church? The New Testament church, yep. Yeah? It's no different from any other church today. You can go church hopping, you can do whatever you want to do, wherever you go, there is this, there is this uh, a, a potential for us to be open to the, 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 these creepers that are going to come in, these men and women who are going to come in and bring false doctrine. I have news for you that the early church was not perfect either. And that's why this word is written that we who now can learn from their mistakes can say, we, we know we're not going to allow that in this church. Amen? You see, just like cancer, the infiltrators will come in. It, it, you know how cancerous cells start? They, they are there. And it's not until a certain time they, they, they sort of manifest. And, and exactly just like this, the, it says, you know, these, these people will be active workers in the kingdom of Satan. Men and women, they hide behind the cloak of Christianity. And in, in other words, they, they act godly. They even speak a bit of godly things and godly terms. But inside, they're twice dead. Turn to someone and say, twice dead. And you know the frightening thing about all this? They appear religious. They appear God-fearing. They appear that they've got it all right. They follow the practices. They walk the walk outward. They talk the talk. You, you know, they've got it made. Like you think, you look at them and you go, you have to just look at all the big preachers that are now collapsing one by one. Because you see, God's revealing that he will not tolerate things in his kingdom. Because God's kingdom is pure and holy. Like an alligator in the, in the water. I was trying to think of what creepers would look like when they come into a church. You know, when you, when you watch uh, National Geographic documentaries, etc., the, the guy's going through the water, and then all you can see is these two little eyes, like, looking out. But what you don't realize, that is, if you don't look out for those two little eyes, there's a big shadow underneath. And the more closer you get, the shadow starts to move, and then within a few seconds, you're gone. That's what the work of Satan can do in a church. 
So what does Jude say to these people? He says, all you creepers that are coming into the church of God, and I'm not just speaking for follow me today. I'm, I, the reason I ask you to pray for churches across Western Australia, across Australia, even in the world, pray for those churches because there is a judgment coming to every creeper, to every person that is not of God. There is a judgment coming and we shouldn't be surprised with this anymore. We shouldn't be surprised. And I've got six characteristics that I want to bring to you this morning about a creeper. There's more, but I'm going to start with six this morning. The first thing about a creeper is they will, they will live lives of license. In other words, a license, what does a license do? It gives you freedom to do something. So a, a creeper in a church will say, it's okay. You want to do that? You want to just, you know, have that relationship or, or you want to have a little bit of alcohol every now and then? Yes, yeah, sure, go for it. I said last time that a little bit of ignorance of an error establishes the sin. We need to be so careful as to what we are actually saying to people and where they are at in their lives. You see, then verse 4 is clear. It says, they turned the grace of God into lasciviousness. In other words, though they openly spoke about God internally, you know, their personal walk, they had none. They had no God in their personal walk. They abused the liberty of Christ. They say, God's forgiven me of all my sins, so now I can do whatever I want. I've got a license. Hyper grace teaching. Be aware of hyper grace teaching. You know what Paul says? Shall we continue in sin? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Why would we want to continue in sin? That's not what gra the grace of God is all about, church. What is the grace of God? As soon as you know what Jesus did on the cross for you, it's a changed life, transformed life. You'd never want to go back to your old. You never want to live in your past. Your life has changed. Your, your, your desires are changed. They're no more carnal. They're more spiritual. And when you go into the spiritual, God gives you what you need for this earth. When you live on this earth. And that's why Paul says you are changed to a new creature, a new creation. That's who you are. And the implication is no man can have forgiveness if he lives a life of license. Because if you continue to do the things that you ought not to do, where is God going to forgive you? How can God forgive you? Today, we see people who take the name of Jesus in vain. How many of us have stood up and said, do not do that. That's the God I serve. But you, any other religion, you'll be bound. You'd be, you know, uh, taken to court perhaps or whatever. But church, I want you to be alert in your workplaces, in your friendship circles. Church leaders are sinning openly. You know, they're encouraging sin around them. There's a lack of reverence for the word of God. And often sin is used to justify the lifestyle of the person. Because there's all this superficial stuff built up, but underneath it's a mess. And Jude says, it, it's a man who thinks he's saved, the character of this person. He thinks he's saved, but he's actually not saved. The life of God is not in his soul. And that's why in 2 Timothy 3 Five, it says we need to turn away. They had a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Church, if there is someone who does not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, or the power that he can have in your life, can I ask you that after the service, come and see one of the pastors. Get to know the Lord Jesus Christ on a personal level. The second character of a creeper in the church is that they deny the existence of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, they, they, it says they deny, in verse 4, the second part says, and they deny the only Lord God, our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why when you have the one word Bible written, there ain't going to be Lord Jesus Christ in there. And you need to be careful about what type of Bible you're going to start reading eventually. And that's why the, the state of the last man is going to be worse than the state of the first man. History is being rewritten. Did you know that? All the atrocities of Nazi, uh, Nazism is being rewritten. History books are being rewritten today. Be 
people have gone through the Bible and they've taken out its record. They've gone through the nativity and they've taken out the virgin birth. They've gone through the miracles and they've taken out the Lord and kept the miracles in. That you may serve the miracle rather than the miracle giver. They've gone to Calvary by taking out the blood of Jesus. You know you're considered, considered weird if you say I've got the blood of Jesus. I've covered myself with the blood of Jesus. I anoint this house with the blood of Jesus. I station his warrior angels around me. They think you're weird. Because yes, they understand that Jesus died for you, but they cannot understand the blood. They've gone to the tomb. It was an empty tomb, but they deny the resurrection. They go to heaven and they say, it's not there. It's here on earth. They go to hell and they say, it's okay. You're, what you're going through now is hell. So heaven and hell are right here. I've got news for you. It's heaven and hell are real. They're real places that, that, that if we want to go to heaven, we've got to come and believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is the only way, the truth, and the life. Amen? That's why Philippians 3, 1 says, my brothers, I, uh, Paul's saying to the people, to the Philippians, he says, I know you think I've heard it all before. I don't want to know any more. I've heard all this stuff before, he says. And he says, I'm, but I want to write to you the same things again and again and again. Why? Not just because I feel I need to tell you that God's telling me to tell you, but that you will be safe. That's what he says, that you will be safe. Your salvation will be safe. This is what God says. Paul is reminding us that, that there is, he cannot manufacture something new about God. What the word of God says God is or who he is, that's what the word of God says he is. Amen, church. Church, you can go to the biggest rallies. You can have the most magnificent music, lights out, beautiful colored lights, dancers, whatever you want, the latest technology and everything. But if God is not in it, you are doomed. Thirdly, the third character of these people who have crept into the church, they are filthy dreamers. They defile the flesh. That means they commit sin. But they despise dominion and they speak evil of dignities. In other words, they despise dominion. They despise people in, who God has placed in authority. They start to question people in authority. You've got to be careful. You've got to be careful that every church needs to be protected lest there is a creeper that comes in and starts to usurp the authority of the person that God has put. Very careful to nip that in the bud quickly. That's why today you see children reject parents' authorities. A wife rejects a husband's authority in the household. We see church members reject pastors and leadership authority. We see governments, you know, oppositions reject the God-appointed person in power. This is a sign of the age that we are living in, and this is a sign of the spirit of the age. Very important. And that's why Jude says, you are filthy dreamers. He says, you are filthy dreamers. You come with all this concoction and you've, and you've, and you've uh, made the church a, 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 a church that is not going to go anywhere. And they've been dreaming about themselves. You know what, Jude, he you know, takes us back right to Genesis when, when he says that, you know, in this, in this passage, when he says uh, that, you, that they can't submit to authority. You know, he takes us back right to Genesis when the devil said, did God say don't eat of that fruit? You know? That's not true. Your eyes will be open. You'll be like gods. Lies. They'll come in with deception. Strangers in the church, how pride always comes in. Pride is one of the greatest sins. The mother of all sins, I would say. I shall be like God, said Lucifer. And these people will consider themselves many gods. Can I ask you to think about those who think of themselves as many gods? Today, in the world... Great people that millions honor and, and in fact worship many gods. And when Lucifer fell from heaven and he tumbled down, God's word is saying to us, so will every many god fall and tumble down. God will bring that pride down. The fourth character of such people, they speak evil when ignorant. It says in verse 10, they speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. 
In other words, they're not going to know the, the depth of the gospel of God. So they'll give you a manufactured solution to God's word. And people go away. The people believe it. They bring in their own little theologies. They bring in all this stuff. And they bring in a manufactured solution to God's word. For example, there's this prosperity teaching that's going around. I'm wealthy. I'm rich. I'm prosperous. I want to be richer. It's all about me, me, me. Yep. That's in the churches today. I want to do miracles. I want to see miracles. I want to say this. I want to have this happen to me. There is this I that has sustained. You look at media and entertainment. It's full of, full of humor about God. They mock God, even on television and, and anything else. Things of God are mocked. And there's no reverence anymore. And that's why Jude says they have no respect for dignities. They work in an intellect, intellectual arrogance. They have, no, they have no respect for leaders in place. Church, God's warning us today that this is not something just for us as follow me that we need to be aware of. Every other church in the world needs to be aware of what Jude's writing. There are many, you know, the, the, everything, there's a, there's a school of rationalization that's going through. Did Jonah, was Jonah really swallowed up by a whale? Did Jesus, you know, really multiply the bread and the fish? Quite impossible. This is rationalization and intellectual rationalization that's going through. But Jesus says in his word, if you come to me as babes, even if you have faith as small as a grain of a mustard seed, I will make that possible for you. We serve a miracle working God. Amen? Amen. Church, I want to bring you to the fifth point of Jude. It, he says, these people who are in the churches today, they are like empty clouds. What is an empty cloud? They are clouds that look full when you look outside, as if they're going to rain, but they're not raining. They just look it. They have promises. These people have promises of giving you something, but they have nothing to give. They are all words. In fact, they're all of pictures and everything else, but they have no sound. They don't have life of God in them to impart it, to impart anything into your soul. And as Proverbs says, church, whosoever boasteth himself of a false gift is like the clouds and the wind without rain. They claim they can't produce. And you'll know people, and that's why ministry struggles sometimes, because by their fruits you shall know them. You shall know them. And lastly, they are twice dead in their character. And I thought about this word, twice dead. You, you all think I'm dead, I'm dead. Yep, your breath is gone. Why did Jude say that they are twice dead? Because when these people are in the church of God, when these people are heading up the church of God, no matter what denomination, no matter where they are, they will be fruitless. Because everything is about them. That's why Jesus says, by their fruits you will know them. But why twice dead? Because they're not just producing fruit, their roots are dead too. And when their roots are dead, God can pluck them out and get rid of them. It's such a warning to our churches today. It's not simply that they can't produce fruit, but they don't even have life in their roots. Church, I want to go to, I want to belong to a church that is full of life, that is vibrant for Christ. You know, I want to end with these two illustrations of this fact. The first one is um, uh, by R.A. Torrey in his book, Why God Used D.L. Moody. I don't know if you've read it, but there's a chapter in there that's called Humility. And, and, and there's one of the reasons. And it says, the entire show entire seashore like a show of the history of Christian workers is strewn with the wrecks of gallant vessels a few years ago but these men they became puffed up and were driven on the rocks by the wild winds of their own raging self-esteem you know when a church exalts itself above the Lord above God you can be sure there's going to be a shipwreck. And another story. And this is where 
I pray that we will never, ever compromise God's word. You know, I don't want to give you a psychological feel good. Here's something. Here's a counseling session for Sunday morning. And now you go home and you're going to be really well. You know, Charles, this is a pastor. He was called home. He, he, uh, Ch- he was a liberal pastor. So a liberal pastor is someone who is like, anything goes. Yep, you don't want to come there. That's fine. No problem. Just, you know, yeah, you want to indulge in a bit. Yep, that's fine. No problem. Charles was called, so he's a pastor. He was called to go to the home of a woman who was dying. And, and this pastor, and she pleaded with him, Reverend, tell me. Lead me to salvation. This is, a, this is his own church member. Lead me to salvation. And he said, don't worry. You've lived a good life. You've done well. You've been a church member. And that's what people, that's, you know, and, and this is church. I want to say this is what people are telling people now. You go to church every day, you're going to be all right. If you were born, because, you know, if your mom and dad were born again Christians, you're going to be all right. You know, even if you don't accept Jesus. Uh-huh. When you stand before Jesus on that judgment day, it's just you and him. No mom and dad, no pastor, no church behind you. Just you and Jesus. And he says, so you've done well. You've been a church member. You've been attending all the meetings. You're going to be all right. Sir, that won't do. Please lead me to salvation. And the pastor was at his wit's end. He didn't know what to do because he had nothing more to say. So he wrecked his brains to try and remember a song that his mother had taught him when he was sitting on her knee. And he found the words. And many of you, older generation and my generation when I was growing up, it says, there is a fountain filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. And she said, that's it. That's where I need to go for my salvation. The next Sunday, the pastor got up to his pulpit and he related that story. And do you know what he said? He said, I had nothing to give this woman. But as I recited it, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. She got it and I got it. Isn't that amazing, church? Are you fighting for your faith this morning? Or are you resisting God? When God's saying, I want you to do this, you're actually saying, no, perhaps no, God. Just, you know, Blossom did that beautiful skit last Sunday. You know, I, I want to look at my mobile phone, God, and God saying, I want to talk to you, girl. Are we resisting God? Perhaps there is someone here this morning who needs a touch from the Lord. Perhaps someone who needs to know the real Jesus. Can I just say it's not too late? Can I just say it's not too late? Let's bow our heads in prayer and give God glory. Can I just feel with the worship team to come up, please? Jesus. Father, as we come before you this morning, as we join together, we declare that you are Lord, you are our God, sovereign God of heaven and earth, the uncreated creator God, the God behind every miracle, the God behind the breath that we have and that there is no one like you Jesus you know everything about us there is nothing hid in 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 you father and this morning I pray for every single person here that they will check in their spirit if there is a spirit of the creeper if there is a spirit of of lag or apostasy somewhere Or is there a spirit that needs to be dealt with? And there will be a coming back to you, Jesus. I thank you that your blood shed on Calvary was shed personally for every single one of us. Personal sacrifice by you for us. How precious are your thoughts towards us. 
how great are your ways towards us. God, if I could even praise you and get every word in the dictionary, I would not be able to testify of how great a God you are because of what you did on the cross. And today, Lord, we stand before you and we commit again that we will walk in your ways, that we will read your word, that we will impart it into our hearts, inscribe it upon our hearts, Holy Spirit, and that we are willing to be led by you. We bless your name, Lord Jesus. Have your way right now in us. Have your way in us right now, Jesus. If there's anyone here who would like to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, he is the soon coming King. And we need to be ready for him. Are you ready, church? Are you ready, church? Praise Jesus. Jesus.